Asia Tech Podcast with Graham Brown and Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Michael Waits. Hello and welcome to Asia Tech Podcast Stories. My name is Graham Brown. Today we are going to journey into the world of biotech. And we're going to learn about bioinformatics, which uses software to help us better understand biological data. We're going to learn about the current drug discovery process. And to do that, we're joined by a PhD in genome science here in Tokyo, Eli Lyons, CEO of Tupac Bio. Welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, thanks for having me. Well, there's so much that we need to talk about and just diving into that world of biotech. I mean, people are familiar with what biotech is about. I mean, they've heard the name, but maybe people don't actually understand what goes on behind the scenes. So we're really going to go a bit deeper into that so people can understand it, especially how technology helps people in that area, you know, understand biological data, drug discovery process, and how you're solving problems which exist in that whole industry. We'll also understand a little bit about how you got into that because you're an engineer by background, right? And you got into the medical industry, the biotech industry. So there's an interesting narrative there. Let's talk about Tupac Bio first. What is it that you do and what is the problem that you're trying to solve there, Eli? Yeah, so we're creating software for biologists, genetic engineers. And um, I, I like to just say, you know, we're, we're creating a tool set that's similar to the tool set that graphic designers may use in, in graphic design. So, so uh, the analogy would be like Adobe Illustrator is to graphic designers as Tupac Bio is to biologists. Hmm. Um, or like uh, for engineers, Digital IC Design, they use very specialized tools um, to design computer chips, and we're making very advanced specialized tools for biologists to design uh, proteins and even in the future genomes. Mm, okay. So help us understand this because designing proteins, is that a thing? I don't understand. I mean, I understand everything that you put together there, but I didn't know biologists actually design proteins. Yeah, so, uh, well, first let me start with a, a little uh, background of, of biotech, um, especially drug development. So I think a lot of people think that all new drugs or like cancer drugs are chemical compounds. Mm. Um, and they used to be mostly chemical compounds, small molecules. But a lot of, uh, in the past decade, a lot of new drugs are antibody-based or protein-based or antibody drug conjugates, where it's a protein connected with a small molecule. Um, but basically, um, that means that a lot of the new cancer drugs, um, or in other areas as well, uh, biologists are doing protein engineering. But um, yeah, so, so the, the point is, uh, you can design or make proteins um, that have the function you want, that it, for example, in uh, drug engineering, you may design a protein that binds to a receptor that's more common on cancer cells than healthy cells. Right. Um, and designing that is a little bit of uh, like trial and error um, and screen, like, you know, designing things or, or just um, testing things even without very rational design methods. Um, but th it is something that's uh, very important and, and common in, in biotech. Hmm. So let's understand here, what you said was previously the world of biotech or drug discovery or drug synthesis was pretty much uh, involving building, creating, designing chemical compounds. But in the last 10 years, it's shifted to, well, organic compounds, proteins. And the reason being is that is that sort of more easily absorbed by the body, more easily integrated into the a biological system? Yeah, so I'm I'm actually not familiar with the small molecule chemical compounds very well, um, but you know previously and still people use use those. You can create a library of of million chemical compounds and test them against cancer cells and see which ones kills the cancer cells, for example. Mm. Um, but I believe a lot of them aren't very effective and also targeted. Um, and the advantage of antibody drug conjugates, for example is you can design a protein that's very targeted and attach like uh, a toxic material to go along with that antibody. Um, but there's a lot of new um, 
ther- therapeutic methods as well. Like a, a, a really hot one right now is immunotherapy, hmm. which, which is taking your immune cells. You can take immune cells out of someone's body, for example, and you can genetically engineer the immune cells to tar- target cancer cells and then put them back in the patient's body. Um, and so there's a lot of new therapies that, that are taking advantage of, of protein engineering or genetic engineering um, to treat cancer in a, a more targeted and effective way. Mm. What's enabled that in the last 10 years? Is it simply an increase in computational power, access to new technologies, or is it a new way of thinking, approaching the whole you know, area of drug discovery and drug synthesis? Ooh, um, so I think... Uh, even even 20 years or more, they, they had some technologies to screen for, for proteins that had the characteristics you wanted, but um, those technologies have just been getting better iteratively, and uh, there's a lot of, there's various, yeah, there's been a lot of improvements, um, for, for example, antibody technologies in the last 20 years um, through generating different kinds of protein libraries, for example, for testing. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, there's a lot of different uh, protein libraries, and the testing methods get better, um, and you get better at at bonding the protein with a chemical compound, for example. Um, but our company, if I could just kind of shift a little bit, our company is really trying to take advantage of of two changes in in biology and synthetic biology. Um, which is uh, improvements in DNA sequencing technologies and improvements in D- DNA synthesis technology. Hmm. Um, so DNA sequencing, I, th- I think you know some people are, are familiar with that, but you know basically just just reading the DNA sequence A T G C T T T, right? Um, the machines, the equipment that that allows you to read someone's DNA. Um, has been improving at a rate that's faster than Moore's law, hmm. um, and so that's already you know becoming more common and, and cheaper to do. And then our company is is trying to take advantage of DNA synthesis technology improvements, which is being able to write DNA. Um, so being able to synthesize DNA in a lab, being able to manufacture DNA in a lab at will, right. um, and that's that's a technology that. Uh, a lot of other companies are improving recently, and and we believe that it will also, you know, improve very rapidly in the next. It will. It's already improving very rapidly, but it will continue to do so. That would be DNA synthesis, as you mentioned. Yes. But, okay. So yeah. w- would that be most relevant in immunotherapy, as you mentioned? Or I'm just curious to know what would be the the tangible impact of this kind of technology here today in the average patient's life right so i uh for for both of the i mean uh, i think both of those technologies dna sequencing and and writing dna dna synthesis are going to have an impact on on patients live lives um you know for for the sequencing side the uh, the dna sequencing has allowed biologists researchers to collect a lot more data Mm. Um, so for example, uh, you know, you can, we've been able to sequence lots of different patients, tumor cells and tumors, and that has provided a lot of data and allowed researchers to start to gain insight into what are the common patterns between, for example, a thousand patients, brain tumors, Mm. right? Um, because each patient may have, um, some slightly different mutations, but when you sequence a, a thousand different patients, you start to see some patterns, possibly, right, among mm. among the mutations that different patients have. So that's uh, a pattern in, in DNA sequencing technology, or something that DNA sequencing technology has helped with. Um, and for DNA synthesis, um, DNA synthesis is going to allow us to, you know, uh, write sequences that code for proteins um, at will. So whenever we want to try a new protein structure, for example, we could design it in software and then immediately test it. Or um, if we want to design a whole uh, pathway of genes, meaning genes that are having some interaction with each other, um, we could design that in software and then write write it as DNA and, and test it in a lab and see how 
that pathway functions. Hmm. Okay. Well, I mean, it's a fascinating area and I don't claim to know anything about this area. So I'm really, what I want to do is ask the questions for the listeners who are really curious about what you're doing and the problem that you're solving and, you know, not sort of, I suppose, assume any kind of knowledge on our behalf as well, because it's so important that, you know, people hear about these terms that you mention, but people don't really know what goes on. So we'll sort of dive a little bit deeper into that in a minute to understand exactly what you're doing and the kind of problems that you're solving, because you know, it's absolutely fascinating. Go back to, I mean, you mentioned tumors as an example. So he, here's what I'm interested in. I mean, you know, from a personal angle, um, not myself personally, but a family member has a, had a history of brain tumor. And I, what was kind of fascinating about that was how little the medical community actually knew in this particular uh, case about the origins of it. Nobody knows how people actually get, in this case, it was GBM multiform, right? Which is kind of common, but extremely aggressive. But, you know, given all the technology that they have, you know, they knew so little about how it actually happened. And also, you know, the unfortunate flip side of that is the, you know, the prognosis is very poor because there's no sort of known longer term cure for it, right? Is that sort of a, a function of not understanding, I mean, kind of going down to the, the gene level that you're talking about? What's missing there to really make that, you know, because there are some cancers, I guess, with a, a very successful um, cure rate, right? But with that, yeah. for example, I mean, what do you know? Is that something that this can solve long term? Yeah, so uh, it's it's um, a coincidence that I, I actually happened to study GBM a little bit in mm. my uh, research in university. And um, so I, I, I'd love to go through that as an example of, of how biologists do research. Right? Please, yeah. And um, so, for example, uh, my senpai, my supervisor, what he did to study uh, brain tumors was uh, he created, he genetically engineered. So, so the first thing I want to say is, we can't do really experiments relating to brain tumors on humans, right? Yeah. So what biologists have to do is they have to model it with animals. And, um, and usually it's a mouse model um, to begin with, right? And, and so my supervisor genetically engineered some, a, a large number of mice um, to, to have mutations in their brain tissue and, and contain, restrict their mutations to the brain tissue. And some and and uh, the mutations were kind of generated at at random in their in their brain tissue. Now some of the mutation, some of the mice, uh, unfortunately got got brain tumors, um, and some of the mice didn't. And uh, after the, after doing that experiment, um, he was able to sequence the the brain tissue from from the mice and and identify mutations hmm. and kind of what I was saying is earlier and what I did in that in that case is I, I looked I looked at the the sequencing data and okay okay we have maybe 30 mice that have brain tumors and um, maybe each mice has uh, uh, you know 30 or 100 different mutations um, in their in their genome the ones that have, have tumors but but if, if 30 mice have brain tumors, um, some of their some of the mutations they have may be the same. Some of them may be different. And so, bioinformaticians or, or you know doing computational biology, what what our job would be to do is, is to figure out which of the mutations are uh, common between the the mice that developed brain tumors, and then also like uh, for example, looking at human patient data and figuring out. Okay, from the data we have about um, humans, patients that have brain tumors, are there also genes that are commonly mutated in those human patients? Mm -hmm. um, and then from that kind of analysis, uh, trying to come up with a few candidate driver cancer genes. So um, there may be genes that are mutated in the brain tumor but not really driving the cancer. Right. Um, but you know, trying to basically trying to tease out what are the driver cancer genes, and then studying those further in a lab, which means um, if you, so, for example, my supervisor found FoxR2, 
Um, and to study that, you know, you take FOXR2 and you overexpress it in cells and see what happens. For example, if you increase the expression of that gene, FOXR2, do the cells start proliferating? Do they start right. growing faster? Um, so let and, me understand. But, yeah. You have a you have a hypothesis, right? You yeah. you study patterns. So just to back up a little bit, you study patterns of uh, gene sequence mutations that yeah. have also not necessarily caused, but have you know. There's also a history of a tumor in that uh, animal or that patient, and then you you look across the patterns. You find you pull out from that some hypotheses, and you need to test those hypotheses in the lab by exemplify or over exaggerating those particular mutations within each uh, modeling it, or within going back to the lab and testing that out in animals as well, and seeing if that then is replicable, right? In, exactly. Okay. Yeah. Good. But uh, I want to I want to just say there's a, there's a couple issues with that whole process. And that's why it's 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 really hard to to really figure out things really clearly. Is why it's the, the mouse model is not always a great model of the human. Hmm. So some of the insights you may find out that cause mouse brain cancer may not cause human brain cancer, for example. Um, and then a lot of the experiments biologists have to like do, like I said, um, taking a, a cell culture, for example and genetically engineering a cell culture. Well, a cell culture doesn't perfectly model um, the cellular matrix, which is the, the kind of 3D environment in your body um, that you have in your body. So, so, so uh, you know, a lot of, some of the insights that are drawn from biology research don't really uh, apply or reflect 100% accurately what's going on in, in, the, in the human. Mm -hmm. If that makes sense. Yeah, completely. And it's very difficult, as particularly if you go back to brain tumors and brain cancer, it's, it's a very difficult cancer to get data on, isn't it? Because, I mean, even, you know, for example, if you had a tumor in any other part of the body, you could easily open it up and take a sample, right? But it's not so easy when it's in some inside somebody's head, right? Literally, from a, a practical standpoint, it's... They don't know. I mean, doctors don't know until they actually open you up and have a look inside whether or not that's actually a, that tumor is actually malignant, right? And that's difficult for your kind of research, I guess. Yeah, that, that's that's right. Okay, excellent, good. Okay, so we've got a, a 101 there, thanks to Eli. Let's sort of move that forward a little bit. You're based in Tokyo, Japan. You're originally from uh, the west side. You're from California in the U.S., um, why does it make sense to do what you're doing in Tokyo? One would have thought that, you know, if you are in any kind of high-tech industry, especially being a startup as well, it would make sense to be in California because you've access to capital, you have access to talent, and, you know, you've access to a global market effectively. But you've chosen Japan. How does that all add up? Can you give us a little bit of background there? Yeah, so if I can um, go back even to when I was doing my master's and, and start from there, I did... Can I start from all yeah, the way back then? Go, yeah, so, exactly. We need to know. Yeah, so I, I was doing my master's um, in computer engineering um, in San Francisco, and I was I really enjoyed the, the work I was doing, but I could also see that the kind of the career path I was on um, was very well defined, and uh, the industry was, was pretty mature. Um, and during my master's, I started to read some academic papers uh, about people applying transistor semiconductor technology to bio applications hmm. um, and including like making sensors from transistors that sense something biological. Um, and in, also, I read some early papers uh, about using semiconductor technology for doing DNA sequencing. Um, and so that started me, like, kind of got my interest into biology going. And but it was it was it was a bit early. So so you know, six years ago, biotech and and all this stuff obviously wasn't as as hot or mainstream as as it is now. And but I, I kind of felt that it was the future, and and so I wanted to learn more about biology. Um, but it was hard to find a a, a place for me where I could learn really a lot of 
about biology with my background hmm. being in computer engineering. And I started learning some biology during my master's, but not not a lot. Um, but I was able to uh, find some, a researcher at a university in me joining um, the lab if I could get into the university. So I had a, a, a good opportunity to, to really learn a lot about bio um, here. Um, and, you know, Japan actually has a lot of great research in, in bio. You know, it's uh, the, the discoverer, or he's kind of an engineer, I would say, as well, um, of uh, uh, iPS cells, which is um, creating, creating stem cells from skin cells. Mm-hmm. Um, was was Japanese, right? And 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 so the, I just want to say, you know, Japan has a has a good um, biotech research. Uh, it's a good place for biotech research. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, wh- what about in terms of the actual Japanese market itself? I know. I mean, Japan is very strong on the research side in, in many industries, yeah. especially in technology. What about the the fact that you're in Japan? And Japan has these unique, um, I suppose, demographic challenges. And we're, we're witnessing now. Yeah, so Japan has this aging population, which basically means, as far as I understand, as a layman, that you're going to have more incidences of the kind of diseases that you're studying, right? That's how I understand it, you know, especially for something like cancer. Older population, it's more relevant. And then also you have this situation where, you know, you have a declining population as well. I mean, the population in Japan is predicted to decline from 125 to maybe 90 million by 2050. So you have a changing population pyramid as, as well. So, you know, there's going to be less focus maybe on the kind of diseases associated or the kind of conditions associated with a younger population. So doing what you're doing, how is that relevant to actually being in Japan and the unique challenges that it faces? Yeah, you know, I I hadn't really con- well. So I guess the first response is you know, Japan is very uh, proactive about um, being at at the edge of of cancer treatments. Even though we're not, um, how to say, we're not making like medical equipment or anything for cancer treatment. We're not uh, a drug company, um, but uh, you know, like uh, Japan has. A, a ton of those, a ton of new machines um, for using the new methods of, of cancer of cancer treatment um, that use some kind of form of uh, ion therapy or, or, or radiation. I forgot how they work, but um, yeah. So I think you know uh, Japan will uh, adopt uh, therapeutic methods for various diseases very quickly. Um, but I think also you know really just. For our company, the reason why I ended up, um, you know, working on a company here is is I ended up finding my co-founders here, mm. and I, I think we will f- will spend extended time in the U.S. <clears throat> um, my co-founder is going to Boston this month, and I'll go to the um, next month as well. And um, as you as you said, like uh, you know, Japan has these issues and. And I and they and we both agreed that they have great research, but I would like to see better commercialization of technology and more support um, and industry growth in the, in in Japan for for biotech. Hmm. So I visited, for example, I visited uh, Singapore in June, and I was super impressed by um, how fast they move and the kind of government support they have um, for for new companies and and just doing research. Um, so, for example, they have a synthetic DNA research foundry, um, so that they're doing a lot of uh, research in, in, in our area. And Japan has, has yet to adopt the same kind of uh, research center. Um, yeah. Do you think you'll be more um, involved with places like Singapore in the future? Yeah. So, so you know, for me, um, also from that conference, I, I got to see some of the things that they're doing in China. And I really think that, um, you know, China, Singapore, U.S., um, U.K., they're going to be really, really strong um, markets and, and just players 
in, in biotech and synthetic biology. Hmm. Um, and so I, I definitely, you know, don't want to, um, be out of the loop. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Okay, good. Switching gears a little bit here, Eli. Uh, okay, so I know you're in biotech and you describe yourself as being involved in that industry, but with your background, what I'm curious about, you're an electrical engineer by training. We've yeah. kind of touched upon it already, but I'm really curious about this overlap between electrical engineering and what you're doing in biology. Because there's, it's a bit of context here. My background is artificial intelligence. You know, I studied AI in the mid nineties, which was well, pretty much an academic pursuit only back then. And it's very different now. And there's so much funding in the industry, but it's fascinating that what started out as, you know, effectively a, a com computational discipline. So computational psychology, cognitive psychology, and so on. Artificial intelligence drew a lot of its real progress when it started getting hooked up with biology because then people realized actually a lot of the problems that we were trying to solve through computational modeling had already been solved in the real world, right? Mm. You know, biology and evolutionary biology, for example, had a lot of the answers. So what appeared as very disparate disciplines were actually, you know, very interconnected, but it took somebody with a different mindset to be able to see that because, you know, often if you study something, and become very good at it. Those kind of people only want to do that. And, you know, if you then start talking about biology in the context of that knowledge, it sort of, it scares some people, isn't it? Because, you know, maybe you trained as an engineer and somebody's coming along with this new bit of information and it, you have to start again almost, right? You have to start at the bottom of the curve and work your way up to understand this. So curious about your, you know, your move from being an engineer into biology and really what the driver was in and how you sort of see all those linking up because they're not obviously connected to most people. Yeah. Um, so I, I guess the, the first thing is to define in, in biology, um, you have research biology, which is trying to figure out which gene, for example, is causing cancer or um, which the function of the gene, right? So it's um, it's a discovery um, hypothesis and testing um, methodology, and then you synthetic biology, which is creating new things from our understanding of research biology. And so, research biology and synthetic biology to me are just like uh, reverse engineering and engineering hmm. in electrical engineering. So in biology, you're just reverse engineering the human body or whatever biological system you're studying, and then synthetic biology, you're engineering something. Um, and I think what's, what's cool is now that we, now that we have, we're, our in, understanding of biology is improving on the research side, we can start to engineer things. And, um, and also, you know, with improvements in synthetic DNA, that's going to allow us to engineer things uh, even faster. Um, and so I think that's, that's kind of why, like my background, as you said, like, uh, I, I really feel like it gives me an advantage because a lot of biologists, um, are only used to reverse engineering something. Hmm. And, um, also I think the, the, the methodology, like I, I had a lot of friction when I entered my lab because, as you said, like kind of people get stuck doing something one way yeah. and thinking one way. And, um, sometimes, you know, someone from another background will start, looks at things differently. That's what I'm curious about. That really fascinates me because, you know, what's in my head is, is thinking, does an engineer think about that problem differently to how a biologist would? So when you approach that, any of the medical problems that you're dealing with, would you, from your training, you know, from what you've learned from a young age, do you go about that problem differently to a trained biologist? Yeah, I mean, well, I think uh, I have so many examples. So um, let's see. I, 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 you know, I think biologists, they're okay. Like, so, so. I think you, you kind of get, uh, uh, people get into habits. And so, for example, um, you start doing one methodology and you get one, one hit out of one out of 10 mm -hmm. success rate. 
but maybe that's, you know, fine for your job or something, um, you may just continue that, that method. Um, and what I mean is, is for example, the thing I was saying earlier about when even you're doing research and, and you're overexpressing a gene, you're increasing the expressing a, a gene of a gene in a cell line, um, and then seeing if that cell line grows faster or slower. Um, even that experiment, like if it's accepted, if you published one paper and that was accepted, you may just continue to use that right. experiment. But uh, maybe for some reason that experiment is too artificial. It doesn't very, it doesn't model what's going on in the body very well. And so I think even just coming from the outside and questioning those methods is is really useful because you're not in the habit of of just of just doing them every day and accepting it but uh questioning why is this why are we doing this mm. is this actually modeling what's going on um but then really on the software side i think um or on the engineering side you know like i'm used to uh using software and engineering um regularly and and biologists really aren't used to using a, a lot of those kind of software tools or, or programming, right? So when I'm creating my software, our software, I, I'm thinking about um, engineering software and how how that was made or... or uh, yeah. Yeah, that whole ability to look at a problem from the outside is really interesting because it's not something that I think necessarily you can train in people through education. It's something that people learn from their own sort of life experience. And it's so important, especially in the area of innovation and what you're doing, that ability to question something and ask why. Because, you know, you ask why because maybe you've seen something else done in a parallel universe, so to speak, which could be in engineering, which works there. And maybe people could use that information in a new discipline, like in bioinformatics, for example. So now we sort of get to the point where we look at your personal background. And here, here's what's interesting, because I'm, I'm sort of want to stay with this, this riff about coming from the outside. And for the listeners, what they may not appreciate, if we were having a conversation myself and my co-host, Michael Waits, about Eli Lyons, and looking at your photo on LinkedIn, you know, the natural assumption was, okay, so this guy is in Japan. Um, he mm -hmm. was educated in California. He looks like a sort of second-generation Japanese growing up in California because there's plenty of them, right? And they often adopt, you know, Western or American names like Ken or something like that. Right. Right? That's quite common, isn't yeah. it? So, but with yourself, Eli, Lyons, you know, we're thinking, where does that sort of fit in? That's not really, you know, it would be something like Eli Nakamura or something like that that would be more right. obvious. But then when I spoke to you off tape, you know, you, we found out you weren't Japanese. Where I'm getting to, the, I'm coming, the, coming from the outside thing, I think your sort of upbringing is really interesting. So help people understand first, let's put this, this, this conversation to bed. Firstly, you're not Japanese, and we got that completely wrong. And that's surprising, because Michael's lived in Japan 20 years. I've lived in, I live in Japan, married to Japanese, so I can kind of see a Japanese face and understand it's Japanese or not. What's the story? Right. Well, it's funny that you said, uh, you know, you thought my name was pronounced Ellie, which is a, uh, a, you know, common mistake in the U.S. and Japan, but even even more so in Japan, because uh, sometimes people like if my name is on a list for some event or something, they think, um, oh, like Ellie Chan, like yeah. Hawaii, you know, like <laughs> they think it's, it's a girl. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, they're disappointed when they see you. <laughs> yeah. Not as cute as they, they expected. <laughs> Oh. yeah but uh yeah so I, i'm from california born on the east coast of the u.s um my mom's of irish and in english uh background uh, maybe third or fourth generation american um and my dad's uh, american born mexican um yeah and and i grew up in in california um yeah, I, I guess uh, I and I studied abroad in Taiwan during university mm -hmm. for three semesters, um, and I so I, I got to kind of get a, a sense of of what Asia you know get some 
uh, get a sense of what Asia was like and, and really living in Asia. And um, I also had a Japanese roommate for a year in college who I'm still close friends with. It's actually funny. He lives down the street from me now. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I guess that's that's really the connection. Yeah, it's, it's not it's not uh, genetic. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. yeah. I mean, that's the fascinating part of the whole sort of personal narrative as well, especially with what you're doing. You know, you have come from the outside of uh, biotech. You know, you weren't uh, uh, originally trained in biotech. I know, for example, that you later on took the PhD in genome science, which would qualify you, but you've come from the outside in terms of your engineering side. Yeah, and- just to clarify, I'm a, I'm a P- PhD like candidate. I, I, uh, I haven't officially gotten my degree yet. Right. But you're in the process, right? Yep, absolutely. Okay, so you know a bit about genome science. That's what I'm trying to say, right? <laughs> right, yeah. <laughs> You're not just an engineer who picked up a book in the library one day. Okay, so you've come from the outside there, and you've come from the outside in terms of, you know, you come to Asia, and it's not easy to crack the Asian market, especially if you don't have the in- immediate connection. I know you had a roommate who was from Tokyo, I mean, from Japan, but that's not you know, necessarily enough to, you know, get you started in Japan and so on. It's not an easy market to integrate into. So you've come from the outside consciously, which I find fascinating as well. And, you know, that, do you ever sort of see those patterns um, in terms of looking at things differently, in terms of solving problems and so on? Do you think that's a sort of a, a, a current or a recurrent theme in your life? Are you aware of it even? That's what I'm sort of curious to know. Hmm. Um, I guess, <laughs> uh, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good question. I, I'm going to, you know, be doing some psychology, psychoanalysis on myself later, I guess. All right. But, I'll put you, I'll put you on the couch now. So, yeah, but I think, um, oh, you know, I, I had a lot of really tough experiences, um, coming from the outside in, in those two aspects, culturally hmm. and academically. So, you know, academically, um, one of the biggest challenges is that I actually, I did both wet lab work and analysis work. And, um, I, I took, a I I like when I was in the, doing my master's, I, I took, um, like a third year biology course without taking any of the prerequisites. Um, and it was very challenging, but I was, I was able to, to pass, but I never did any lab work before I came here. And, uh, learning to do wet lab work was really tough. Um, and also getting used to the failure associated with doing experiments mm. was something I had not experienced before in engineering. And that was uh, really tough mentally um, for me. And at, at the same time, you know, so as an outsider, right? And, um, and you know, also like people looking at me and, and like I'm, I'm failing exper- experiments all the time um, didn't feel good. Mm. <laughs> And at the same time, you know, it was, of course, hard to get used to uh, the, the different culture, um, especially in, in, in my lab where it's very hierarchical. You know, like I was used to the American kind right, of lab yeah. where, like, I was, like, friends with my supervisor, you know. Um, we would maybe go grab a coffee or, or grab lunch or something or, you know, just have a chat. Um, but... In, in Japan, I, I felt that, uh, you know, my, my supervisor had a, a lot of power over me. Um, mm. and, uh, and it was, and also, you know, the, the relationship was re- very different and the decision making process was very different. Um, and that was hard to get used to. And, and, you know, I've had a lot of difficult learning experiences like that in, in school and also, um, mm. In industry, I, I was actually at a previous, at a, another startup previously, um, and that was uh, where the other co-founders were all Japanese. And um, you know, we had we got along uh, great in some ways, and and uh, I had some difficulty in some ways. But um, you know, those are really tough experiences. Mm. But I'm I don't think it's like which Japanese like um, you know most of my investors now are, are Japanese. Um, and, and we get along just great. Um, and, and, you know, there's Japanese I work with. My advisors are also Japanese, um, for our company and, and we get along just great. Um, so I don't want to like, you know, make any specific 
bad examples or anything. But. No, no. I mean, it's not Japan yeah. you're talking about. It's, it's a new culture, yeah. isn't it? This could happen as yeah. much in China or Japanese moving to America or, or whatever. But th that point about these difficult experiences, that's what you've consciously chosen. And that really is what's inspiring about your story for anybody thinking of doing the same, isn't it? Because you've got comfortable with being uncomfortable if that makes sense you know you could have easily just stuck out electrical engineering and just become you know the name in the field in that you could have become a professor at university or whatever it is that you could have pursued you could have built up that that knowledge base and that experience and that name and never changed it but you've consciously stepped out and decided to pursue these challenges where you put yourself in very difficult situations you know and may, one of these things maybe you don't think about it maybe you don't consciously step back and think yeah, yeah that's me because it's just kind of what you do <laughs> but that's what you've done right and that's what other people will look at and say okay that's what i need to do you know if i'm going to go and start my own startup i have to be prepared to do this I have to be prepared to, you know, be a beginner in a sense. I know you're not a complete beginner when you go in because you're bringing in this knowledge, which other people don't have. But to put yourself in a situation where, you know, a lot of people may feel I'm sort of moving backwards in a way. But, you know, that's key to moving forwards long term. And I think that's a really inspiring part of your story, like, and maybe one which you don't consciously think about, as I say, but that's kind of like what I see looking from the outside. Yeah, so I I think I I certainly did not expect you know my story to work out like it has now, um, I it, exactly like it has now. But I at the same time um, I did make a conscious decision, right? Like when I when I was doing my masters, I was like, okay, well I can finish my masters, I can study PhD in electrical engineering, try and become a professor or or a researcher at 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 Intel or um, you know, I can finish my master's and I can, you know, work, uh, get an awesome job in the suburbs and, and have a mm. white picket fence. Um, and none of those things, and, and, you know, like kind of do iterative improvements in the industry yeah. I'm in. And none of those things just really appealed to me. I, I, I did want to challenge myself further. And um, I did see that there was some kind of trend. It wasn't as super clear to me, um, but you know, I, I could see the trend of 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 engineering being applied to biology and, and vice versa. Mm. And um, so I, I made a conscious decision in in some ways, but I, I had no idea what where it would really lead me. Mm. Yeah, but the story is fascinating altogether, and it's leading you in the right direction. And it's one of those things, I think we talked about it at the beginning of the interview, about joining the dots. I know Steve Jobs is always famous for saying that, about it always makes sense when you sort of look back and how things sort of fit together, as if there was a master plan. So when you do tell it, you can tell people as if there was a master plan from day one. This right. is how it's all going to work out, even though it's a bit more haphazard in reality. You're going to have to edit the podcast then. Yeah, exactly. Well, people will work it out. Or when you come back on, you kind of got all your story together. But I think it's been fascinating listening to it and inspirational as well. That's Eli Lyons, everybody, the CEO of Tupac Bio. Eli, before we let you go, please share with us some link or links where the listeners can go and find out more about you because I'm sure they want to find out more about your, um, you know, your thing at Tupac Bio as well as your story as well. Sure. Our website is www.tupac.bio. Excellent. And yeah, please come back on in future, Eli, because I think we've only scratched the surface, really. And maybe that's the, the general theme of your own personal story as well, that it's unwritten, the future, and there's so much more to come, right? So it'd be great to have you back on because I thoroughly enjoyed talking to you today and also learning you know a lot about biotech and bioinformatics and hopefully the listeners enjoyed that too feel free to you know reach out and find out more about eli at the link provided and eli thank you so much for today oh thank you for having me it was a pleasure you've been listening to asia tech podcast find out more at www.asiatechpodcast.com